Hello everybody. Zdravím všechny příznivce anglické výslovnosti. Tentokrát zde zdravím opět naše studenty, studenty prvního ročníku, protože je zde připravena další přednáška, která je na téma anglické slabiky. Budeme si tedy povídat o slabice, podíváme se na ní poměrně detailně. Seznámíte se s termíny jako je například onset, peak, coda. Naučíme se, jak lze slabiku analyzovat. Je to tedy téma poměrně odborné. Mám tak trochu pocit, že je ještě více akademické a odbornější než minulé. A moc se tedy omlouvám vám, běžným uživatelům, kteří se na můj YouTube kanál díváte, že je to opět takové poměrně těžké téma, ale třeba zase budete mít chuť nakouknout pod pokličku a chvíli se zaposlouchat do univerzitní přednášky. Určitě bych zde také chtěla přivítat třeba naše absolventy a nebo studenty vyšších ročníků, kteří kdysi měli tyto přednášky možnost slyšet naživo. To teď bohužel nejde. Na druhou stranu ale současní studenti mají možnost vychutnat si, no nevím jestli vychutnat, ale poslechnout si takovou přednášku z pohodlí svých domovů. Takže se v klidu usaďte, uvařte si dobrou kávu, nebo horký čaj a samozřejmě se plně soustřeďte, protože toto téma si to opravdu žádá a můžeme se pustit do práce. Než se do přednášky pustíte, doporučila bych vám, abyste si vytiskli worksheet z lekce 4 v našem mudlinkovém kurzu, který se váže k přednáškám a také si můžete vytisknout powerpointovou prezentaci, kterou budu promítat a kam si můžete dělat poznámky. Tentokrát na konci videa žádné bloopers nenajdete, a to z jednoho prostého důvodu. Originální video jsem si bohužel smazala. No, to jasně dokazuje, že krása pomíjí a blbost je věčná. Co víc dodat? Teď už ale, milí studenti, v klidu se usaďte, zaposlouchejte se a můžeme začít. Let's get started! Promiňte, že vás ještě vyrušuji, ale nakonec i krátké bloopers se najdou, protože v rámci nahrání tohoto pidi úvodu, kratičkého úvodu, jsem se bohužel jako vždy stihla několikrát přeřeknout. Zase jsem to neřekla tak, jak bych to chtěla říct. Um, takže i ty bloopers mohly vzniknout. Teď už se ale nenechte rušit. Bye! Hello everyone! And welcome to today's lecture on the English syllable. The notion of a syllable is something we are all familiar with. We are able to count syllables pretty much in any language, and even small kids can count syllables quite easily. Let's try it out. For instance, if I say the word phonetics without much thinking, I'm sure you're all able to come up with the correct number of syllables. So how many are there in the word phonetics? Correct, there are three. How about phonology? So if I say phonology, phonology, how many syllables are there? Phonology, four. Excellent. We can try a shorter word. If I say teacher, table, how many syllables? Just two. So as you can see, this is quite an intuitive thing to count syllables. It's not difficult at all. We can have a monosyllabic word, which is just one syllable in a word, but we can have also very long words, even up to seven syllables. However, This is not the aim of today's lecture, to count syllables. It was just a short warm-up. Uh, because you're university students, so you need to know much more. We'll try to have a look at the syllable in more detail and um, we'll try to define it both phonetically as well as phonologically. To start with, we can define a syllable in more general terms And we can say that it's a very important unit in terms of the rhythm of speech. We can also say that it's a basic rhythmical phonic unit. In other words, 
it is the carrier of the rhythm and also stress. Well, this is very logical because stress and rhythm are closely related. Try to think about stressed syllables and weak syllables or unstressed syllables. Try to think about weak and strong forms that we'll talk about later. It's all related to stress. So don't forget that it's the carrier of the rhythm, but also stress. As already mentioned, we can describe syllables phonetically as well as phonologically. What does this mean? If you look at the phonetic description, so there you can see the keywords such as abstraction, turn airflow, and uh, this is closely related to vowels and consonants. This is what we discussed last time, right? When we discussed vowels, we said there's normally no obstruction to the airflow. However, when we talked about consonants, we mentioned that there was always an obstruction to the airflow. So if we read this and we say that syllables consist of a center which has little or no obstruction to airflow and which is comparatively loud. So if you read no obstruction, so logically, what is going to be in the center of the syllable? correct, a vowel. So we can say that the center of the syllable is normally vocalic. But then we can also have something before and after the center or at the beginning and the end of the syllable and there will be greater obstruction to airflow and less loud sound. Well, logically this will be a consonant. So normally at the beginning and at the end of the syllable if there's something you know before and after the center which is normally a vowel so there'll be consonants that's why we are describing uh, the presence or absence of an obstruction to the airflow now if you look at the phonological description so uh, we will look at the possible combinations of phonemes within a syllable again it's about possible distributions of individual sounds, how they can co-occur or coexist, how they can combine within one syllable. And this is what we'll mainly deal with today. Let us have a look at several terms closely related to the structure of the syllable. The first one is a minimum syllable, or you can also say a minimal syllable. It's a single vowel in isolation. Well, in other words, these are words that consist of only one syllable and this syllable consists of only one vowel. So, as it says, it's a single vowel in isolation. Um, well, these are examples. For instance, a, o, i. Now, be very careful because you have to look at what you say and not what you write. If you look at the written form, you may say, well, but there are three letters, a, r, e. But we are looking at, or we are always, we always analyze what we say. And also, we have to bear in mind there's a difference between British and American English. So, if I'm discussing British English, I'll simply say, r, so you can hear that there's just a single vowel R which represents the whole word and this is a minimum syllable. Another example is being O or for instance I. I like I but it can also be I here but the sound is just a single vowel and this is a so-called minimum syllable. Then there are some other terms that we need to discuss and these are an onset and a coda. So, what is an onset? It is one or more consonants, three at maximum, preceding the center or so-called peak of the syllable. So now, if you try to think what I said earlier today, and you still remember it, I said that the center or the peak of the syllable is normally a vowel. It's a vocalic center, right? So, for instance, imagine there's I. Now, if we talk about an onset, so onset is what precedes. And again, that's also what we discussed. There may be one or more consonants at the beginning of a syllable, three at maximum. So for instance, I can put down D in here and I'll get the word die or the syllable die. And D represents 
an onset of the syllable die. It's still one syllable, right? There's the peak and this is an onset. So what is in front of the peak? Then we can also have a coda. A coda is one or more consonants, four at maximum, following the center or peak of the syllable. So imagine that here I've got I and I want to make it plural. So instead of I, I'll say eyes, like my two eyes. So here you can see that I added Z at the end or after the peak after the vocalic center and thus I've got a coda consisting of just one consonant and we can say that a coda is what follows the peak. So this is an onset, this is a coda. So in this word we'll say okay there's a peak and a coda. Well of course we could combine it all together and we could have dies uh, and that would be still one syllable, but there would be an onset, d, peak, i, and then a coda, z, dies. Going back to the first example, i, don't forget that this is a so-called minimal syllable. So this is a word that consists of only one syllable, and this syllable consists of only one vowel. We've already talked about an onset and a coda of the syllable. Again, onset is what is at the beginning of the syllable. So it's either one or more consonants at the beginning of the syllable before the central part. So this is an onset. Then coda is at the end of the syllable. So it's either one or more consonants at the end of the syllable and it's so-called coda. And then you've got a very important central part which is called a peak. So again, if we think about the structure of the syllable, it can be divided into three parts. An onset, a peak and a coda. An onset is the beginning, a peak is the middle part and a coda is the end of the syllable. As you can read here, peak is the vocalic center of the syllable. And if I say vocalic, well, this is an adjective related to vowels. So it means that peak is normally realized by vowels and because it's realized by vowels, so logically there's no obstruction to the airflow. And we can also say it's the strongest part within the syllable. That's also why it's called peak, right? So if it's peak, so it's the strongest part within the syllable. So it is the part that carries the stress if the syllable is stressed. Let's practice for a bit. This is our worksheet for today. If you haven't prepared it, you can still do so. Simply pause this video and go to our Moodle course, the lecture Moodle course. Go to lesson four and download the handout that you can see here. Analyze the structure of the following syllables. Again, please remember that we need to analyze what we say not what we write, although in the first case it doesn't really matter. And we're analyzing these four words in terms of their structure, in terms of an onset, a peak and a coda. If we look at it, very simple to transcribe, and what can you see? There's a vowel part, so that would be a peak, and then there's a consonant, following the peak, so if it follows the peak, if it comes after it, it has to be a coda. So here we would say it's a peak and a coda. Now let us look at number two and it's the word sat. So again I'll transcribe it first, although again in this case it doesn't really matter because the number of phonemes and the number of letters are identical but still it's always better to transcribe if you want to deal with the syllable. And if we look at this, so again we can see three parts of this word and of this syllable. There's one syllable and we can see there's a vocalic part in the center, so this is the peak, but this time there's also one consonant before the peak, so it is an onset 
and then there's one consonant following the peak, so it must be a coda. Okay, let me squeeze it in here, sorry. So it's an onset, peak and coda. This is the structure of this syllable. Let us look at number three and be careful here because although you can see one, two, three, four, four letters in writing and you can see two consonants at the beginning, this is not what we normally analyze, but we need to analyze the pronunciation or the transcription, what we say. So we transcribe it as no. And then logically, again, how would you divide this syllable? Well, again, I can see the vocalic, the vowel part. So this is a peak. And in front of it, I can see one consonant. So this is an onset. And there's nothing else. So there's no coda. We can call it zero coda, but I'll talk about this later. If we look at the last word, again, we need to be very careful because we need to see the difference between the written form and its pronunciation. Even though you can see several letters in writing, I'm sure you all know how to pronounce this word. It's though. We can see there's only two phonemes. There's the diphthong O and then there's a consonant the. So logically then we'll say there's a peak consisting of the diphthong O, this is the vocalic part, so this is the peak, and what comes before is an onset, and there is an onset consisting of just one consonant. We should now look at the onset and the coda in more detail. Let's start with the onset, and there's a term that says zero onset. So if I say zero, what follows is very logical because it's no onset preceding the peak. So zero onset means there'll be no consonants at the beginning of a syllable. And thus the syllable begins with a vowel, with a peak. There are examples such as am, ought, is, and I'm sure you'd be able to come up with many other examples. So remember, again, onset is the beginning of the syllable and we may have so-called zero onset which means there's no consonant or no consonants at the beginning of the syllable and thus the syllable starts with a vowel straight away so it starts with the peak similarly to zero onset we can also have a zero coda so you already know that a coda is the end of the syllable what follows the peak it can be one or more consonants together at the end of the syllable. So if I say there's also a zero coda, so logically there's no coda following the peak, which means that there's no final consonant. So there's no consonant at the end of the syllable. And this is also possible. So you can have syllables or words such as bar, key, more, where you have an onset and a peak but there's no coda. I'm well aware of the fact that I've said it many times today, but let me point it out again. And don't forget that if you look into the structure of the syllable, you always analyze what we say. It means pronunciation and not what we write, spelling. Just to be on the safe side, if you're to describe the structure of the syllable, always transcribe it first. Put it down by means of phonemes. Don't look at the spelling, but look at the way it is pronounced. And there's one more term you should be familiar with when discussing the structure of the syllable. And this is a so-called consonant cluster. So what is a consonant cluster? Well, this is a group of consonants together and it has to be at least two consonants, two or more. And of course, we'll discuss the fact that in English, we've got not so many consonants together within one consonant cluster, unlike in Czech, where we can have quite long consonant clusters. If you think about the Czech tongue twister, strč, prst, skr, skrk, or if I say strp, klá, trnka, well, you can hear there's many consonants together without any vowel, in between. This is not so frequent in English, 
but there's also a combination of certain consonants that can be put together. And this is exactly about the, the onset and the coda of the syllable, because we know it is an onset and a coda that consist of consonants. So let's practice now. If we look at the onset, so it says that there can be three consonants at maximum. Um, and we can talk about pre-initial, initial and post-initial consonants. Normally, if there's only one consonant, which is quite a frequent case, uh, in the onset, so then it is the initial consonant. The initial consonant can be any consonant except for the vila ng, because this normally occurs at the end of words, right? Or at the end of syllables. And also, j is quite rare in the onset. Now, let us have a look at a pre-initial consonant. Well, pre-initial consonant will normally combine with the initial consonant, and it can only be s in English. And then we've got post-initial consonants, and these can be l, r, w, and y. If you look at the onset, you can see two consonants, h and y. Now you know that the pre-initial consonant can only be s. So logically there's no s. Thus we'll start with the initial consonant that is h because there's no pre-initial and then y can be a post-initial consonant. So we'll say that the structure of the onset here is initial and post-initial. If you look at the next word, quick, so again, we are looking at the onset only at this stage, and you can see k and w. Again, you know that the pre-initial consonant can only be s, so if we start with the initial consonant, that is k, and then the other one has to be post-initial, and that is w. Now, if you look at the last word, smell, and we look at the onset, so you can see that the onset consists of two consonants, so it's a consonant cluster comprising two consonants, and, um, well, this time you can see the sound s preceding another sound, so logically s has to be pre-initial consonant and then m will be initial consonant. So if you've got a combination of two consonants in the onset, always try to think about the one which is initial, so that always has to be the basis, the initial consonant, and then either the other consonant is pre-initial, which means it precedes the initial consonant, or post-initial, which means it follows the initial consonant, which is the basis. Let us look at one more example of the onset. This time it's the onset comprising three consonants. This is the maximum of three consonants. If you think about them, s, p, l, how would you divide them into pre-initial, initial and post-initial? So the initial one is in the middle, so this is initial. And then what comes before it is pre-initial and what follows is post-initial. So this is uh, an onset where you can see the maximum of three consonants. Now we'll have a look at the coda in more detail. Let's move on to exercise three. In the same way as we analyze the onset, we can also have a look at the coda, but there are two differences. First, in the coda we'll be talking about final consonants and the combination of pre-final, final or post-final consonants. And second, there can be four consonants at maximum. So in the onset there were only three at maximum, but in the coda there can be even four. Of course, the combination of four consonants in the coda is rather rare in English. As I've already mentioned, English doesn't like consonant clusters in such a way as Czech likes it, but still, it can also happen and we'll look at some examples together. Let us have a look at the first example. It's the word but, and we're only 
focusing on the coda. Here, because there's only one consonant, it is going to be the final consonant. So if there's just one consonant at the end, it's the final consonant. Let's say that the final is always a kind of basis, right, of the coda. And if there's only one, it's the final consonant. It can be any consonant except for H, W, Y. So in this case, it's final. If you look at the second example, must, we know that if there's two consonants, we have to remember the possible combinations. And if you can see sound S followed by something, any other consonant sound, it is a combination of pre-final and final. So this one, looking at the coda, this is the combination of pre-final and final. Again, always try to start with the final consonant and then try to think whether the other consonants in the coda are in front of it or following it. Let's have a look at the third example and the third example is helped. The past tense of the verb help. Again, we look at the coda only and we can see three consonants. L, P, T. Let's start with the final one. Well, final one can be any except for Hawaii. So it is going to be the one in the middle, this is final, the one in front of it or before it is pre-final, yes it's true because le can be a pre-final consonant, so this one is pre-final, and t, which is the suffix added to the base form, right, or to the infinitive to make the past tense, it has to be post-final consonant. So this is a combination, if we've got three consonants, is the combination of pre-final, final and post-final. Let's have a look at number four, bonds. The coda is the three consonants following the peak, the vocalic center. Now we can see the combination of three consonants. So let us first try to think what's the final, the main consonant. It's the D in the middle. So this one is final, and then we know that what is in front of it, or what comes before it, is N, and yes, it can be pre-final, and logically it is pre-final if it is before it. And then Z here, this is the suffix to make plural, so it's something added to the base form, to the singular form to make plural, so logically it must be a post-final consonant. Let us also deal with a coda that consists even of four consonants. This is not very frequent in English though, but you may still come across it every so often. Prompt. You can see four consonants following the peak of the syllable. So it is a coda and now we just need to know what is the final consonant first and then we'll be able to say what the rest of the consonants are. Well, we know that a final consonant can be any consonant except for Hawaii, and that the pre-final consonant can be M, N, N, L, or S. And I can see M, P in here. So then I can say, okay, P is going to be the final consonant. M, pre-final, because it's before it. And then we've got post-final one and post-final two. So this is the combination where you've got four consonants in the coda, pre-final, final, post-final post one and post-final two. To sum up, this is the maximum phonological structure of the syllable. There's an onset, a peak and a coda. Peak is the vocalic part, so it's a part that is in the center and it consists of a vowel. And then we've got something that may come before it, and it can be up to three consonants at maximum. And you can also have consonants at the end of the syllable. We call them a coda. And coda can consist of four consonants at maximum, but that's already quite an extreme combination. Normally, there'll be just one, two, or possibly three. 
Uh, if there are four, they can combine in various ways. It can be final plus three post-finals, or it can be pre-final, final, and two post-finals, uh, but four at maximum. If it's a combination of three, it's usually pre-final, final, and post-final consonant. When looking at exercise four, you can see that it deals with syllabic consonants. I'm sure it rings a bell, and you all know what syllabic consonants are. Let me just comment on it very briefly. Syllabic consonants are consonants that are able to make a syllable without the presence of a vowel. So this is basically a syllable where there's no vowel. This is quite frequent in Czech, in our mother tongue. Try to think about words such as blbet, prst, krk, stroč, prst, krs, krk, petr, tr. So for instance, if you look at the word Petr, you can see there are two syllables, P and TR, but the second syllable TR does not have a vocalic peak in it, does it? So these are syllabic consonants. I mentioned some of them in Czech or provided examples in Czech. In English, syllabic consonants are not as frequent as in Czech, but there are some. There are five of them. And they should be put in here, so you can try to think think about them and remember which they are. And they are M, N, N, L, R. So these are five syllabic consonants that we've got in English. And you should also remember that we indicate syllabicity with these consonants, but a little vertical line beneath them. This is how you indicate syllabic consonants in transcription. So now, if you look at this exercise, can you identify the possible syllabic consonants in these words? Let's have a look at number one and number five. If you look at number one, cattle. So I can either transcribe it this way, and you can see two syllables, cattle. The second syllable here, is transcribed with the schwa. But what I can do here, because le can be syllabic, is that I'll cross it out and I'll, instead of saying kettle, I say kettle. That's very frequent, right? Syllabical bottle, kettle. So that means I can do this. So this is the first example. If you look at the last example, particular, it's really interesting because if I pronounce it in British English, I can't really illustrate a syllabic consonant, particular, because in British English uh, there would be a silent R sound, I wouldn't pronounce it. However, let's have a look at the American version where we pronounce the R because it's a rhotic accent, so I'll say particular. So you can hear that I'm pronouncing the R in here in the first syllable and particular particular, and the R in the last syllable. We know that the syllabic consonants typically occur at the, end in, at the end of weak syllables. So there's the schwa in them. So we can say, or we can transcribe it slightly differently and also pronounce it without the schwa, and we can say particular. This is an example of the syllabic R in American English, particular. And again, you've got two options. You always have two options. You can either transcribe it with the schwa and the r, or normal r, or you can transcribe it without the schwa and then you get the syllabic consonant. Before we finish, let us briefly look at the difference between strong and weak syllables. What does it actually mean if I say this is a strong syllable and this is a weak syllable? Well, you can perhaps fill in the missing letters in here. It's not difficult at all, is it? So strong syllables are stressed and weak syllables are unstressed. So if we talk about weak syllables, they're unstressed. And if we talk about strong syllables, they're stressed. What's the difference between weak and strong syllables and the vowels in them? So, because you know that the vowel is a peak of the syllable, and if it's 
a weak syllable, then this vowel tends to be shorter, of lower intensity, or we can say it's less loud, and it's different in quality. If I say different in quality, well, you may remember we had three special vowels that were weakened and never stressed. And my question is, which they are? Well, you should definitely remember the one which is the most famous and the most frequent one. Which is it? Sure, it is the famous schwa. So we know that the schwa is never stressed, so it is one of three weak vowels. Do you remember the other two? They are less frequent, but they still exist. And it is the happy vowel E, typically used at the end of words in unstressed syllables. But it can also be used in some weak forms, such as he, she, we, me. And the other one, or the last one, the third one, which is even less frequent, is the thank you vowel, transcribed this way. The thank you vowel is really rare and it will occur, for instance, in the weak form you or to. Finally, the last question for today. Is a weak syllable the same as a weak form? Of course, it's not. If we talk about syllables, we're at the level of syllables. So we'll, for instance, look at syllables within words. And in a word, there'll be one strong stressed syllable and the rest of the syllables will be usually weakened and it is the level of syllables. However, we know that if we talk about weak forms, so these are special words, so-called function words, or we can also call them grammar words. And these are typically monosyllabic words that can have two forms. They can have a strong form and a weak form. The strong form is the one that is less frequent. So it is the weak form that is much more frequent. And we have to remember that an active consistent use of weak forms is a must for any competent user of English and absolutely crucial for a good teacher of English. And this is the end of today's lecture. Thank you for your attention and have a lovely day. Well, if you look at what I've just said and you look at its transcription, thank you for your attention, I can illustrate what we've discussed today. You can have a look at three weak forms here. The personal pronoun you, the preposition for, and the possessive pronoun your are all pronounced as weak forms in this sentence. Thank you for your attention. This is the first thing. And then another thing I can illustrate that we discussed today is the syllabic consonant n in the word attention. So you can see that instead of transcribing the last weak syllable uh, with the schwa and the n, sh, e, uh, n, I left out the schwa and used the syllabic consonant n instead. You can see the little vertical line beneath the phoneme n, which shows that the n is syllabic. Thank you for your attention and have a lovely day. Bye. Takže nakonec můžeme říct, že online výuka má i některé, některá pozitiva. Tedy every cloud has a silver lining, doesn't it? Ale, um, tedy dinkin, dinkin, king. Než se do přednášky pustíte. Uh -huh. jo. See you later, alligator. Ježišmarja, tak už zase melu. Ty voga. Už zase meleš nesmysly. Už zase melu nesmysly. Takže se na to budu soustředit. No, teď těším, že je Stelinka na záchodě, tak ještě chvíli počkám pro jistotu. Katastrofa, no tak nahrávací studio nemám, takže vždycky se něco vyvrbí, no. 
někde nějaký zvuk, pazuk, hluk. Tak dobrý, čistý vzduch, můžu to dokončit. <kým> Ach, ty boga, ty boga, peklo, tak ještě jednou. Tedy i ten materiál pro, bl- pro Blue Pass se tady našel, takže i ten materiál ješkový zraky. <kým> takže naposledy, teď, teď, teď. Um. Prčic, <kým> tak ještě, teď už, poslední. Teď už to musím dát. 